Richard, nice to see you again. How are things? Hey, good morning. Good morning, Steve. It's good to see you. Uh, thank you so much for uh, chatting with me. It's, um, I'm, I'm really excited for our conversation. Of course. No, it was great to have you on the call yesterday as well. You definitely contributed a lot to the group, so I was glad to have you there. Yeah, well, thank you. Thank you. That's, uh, that's very kind of you. Um, yeah, I, I, I like that you've kind of brought people together. It looks like a very supportive community, so uh, it's definitely something that folks should take advantage of. Yeah, it's cool. I mean, the students create the community, so I just provide the space but it's fun to play there. So yeah. I know we, we talked a bit yesterday, but mm -hmm. how's everything sinking in for you since then? Yeah, yeah, uh, I, I gotta say, uh, it, was, it was good to get some advice from folks yesterday. Um, I think that one thing that I, I wanna take is being deliberate about my review process, uh, not just doing it ad hoc, but actually being more targeted. I think I could be a bit more targeted um, and also giving myself room to just take breaks. Uh, I think that that's important. Um, I'm close to my goal, uh, at least if my practice tests are a reliable indicator. Um, but I've still got plenty of runway between now and October. And so I want to make sure that I'm uh, being deliberate about how I study. Sure. Okay. So we've talked about review. Um, I assume you may be familiar with the Socratic review method I've laid out. And so I guess the question, if you, is that the case? Are you familiar with it? Uh, I mean, I, somewhat, somewhat. Um, I think, you know, asking questions, figuring out, you know, why, if, if, I, if I was down to two answers, you know, what, what was attractive about the wrong answer? What was discouraging about the right answer? Um, things like that. Okay, yeah. So you got the general theme underlying, yeah. the general principle there. So what would you say is the, your biggest challenge that I could support you on? So I have actually three main questions, um, but they're, they're basically just what separates a 160 score, which is what I'm getting from a 170 score in each of the three main, you know, sections. Um, and so I have more specific concerns I have for each of the sections. Um, but in general, that's kind of th those, uh, that's the question I would, I would like your help answering for all three sections. Sure. Yeah. Okay. So first thing that comes to mind is not simply blindly applying the strategies, but understanding why the strategies work. That's overarching across all sections. Okay. And I'm typing, by the way. So. Yeah, sure, sure. With regard to games, it comes down to a couple things. One is efficiency. And efficiency comes down to reusing previous hypothetical scenarios and making more inferences up front. Someone who's getting a 170 is typically getting perfect on games, maybe minus one. But games are the most perfectible, and so there's not really room to sacrifice points there. And obviously there are exceptions, but generally top scores are getting perfect on games. Again, maybe minus one. The other thing is being ready for curveballs. And so that means not simply, again, not simply blindly, blindly applying strategies, but rather being adaptive and being flexible so that even if a new unfamiliar game appears, you'll be able to handle it. Okay. Logical reasoning against Socratic review method. So leaving no stone unturned, unturned in terms of your, where your misunderstanding may have stemmed from. It could be the stimulus, the stem, or the choices. You talked about the choices already, but I will also encourage you to think about the method of reasoning in the stimulus. And being, again, flexible with that method of reasoning such that it's not just about question type. You could drill questions by type, people often do. So flaw versus necessary assumption and such. But mm -hmm. I would be looking for you to see how a test maker could take a given method of reasoning and convert it into a wide variety of question stem types. So flaw and necessary assumption being two sides of the same coin. Necessary assumption, what is required, what assumption is required in order for the argument to work and then for a flaw question, we would say, okay, well, that underlying assumption, what if we accuse them of taking that for granted or failing to consider that that may not occur? Hmm. Okay, so that's, that's about, good. Yeah, so thinking about how the, they go about even c constructing these questions in the first place, where you could imagine mixing and matching stimulus and STEM. Okay. And then yeah. that would simply require a slight reframing of the answer choice. Yeah, yeah, because I was thinking that, you know, people kind of talk a lot about the question and I'm like, well, 
actually, I, I care more about what's in the stimulus because if I know, if I understand the stimulus fully, it doesn't really matter what the question is. Um, so I think that just being able to have a handle on that and, I, and you talk about method of reasoning, uh, I guess my next question would be, how do you break down the method of reasoning? Uh, is that like the diagramming? Uh, is, that, is that how you do it or is there something else involved? It's not really about diagramming to me. It's logical reasoning. Most questions types don't really benefit from diagramming because most of it's informal logic or inductive reasoning rather than deductive where you have formulas and conditionals. Okay. So if I'm reading the stimulus, when I think of the, their method of reasoning, is that's just more in general, what are their premises? What role do those premises play in supporting the conclusion? Um, things like that. Yeah, so how do they go about making their argument? What are the underlying principles? And how okay. is it possible for the evidence to be true, yet for the conclusion to not necessarily follow? So how can you problematize it? Okay. So when you're dealing with causal claims, it raises questions. Well, what about alternative possibilities? What about alternative explanations? How can we know that the, the supposed cause is in fact the cause or the only potential cause? So I'm, okay. I'm looking for real world engagement there. And that's not something diagramming can help you with. I find that students often over rely on diagramming as if it's going to unlock the answer when in reality, you're simply converting every subject into a capital letter, but it may not really be getting you anywhere. And so okay. that's, that diagramming approach, I think, is more along the lines of a rote and simply blindly applying something you heard from somebody else without really thinking about, is this truly serving you? Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah, that's, that's, uh, that's pretty big. So um, how many, when you approach logical reasoning, how many questions or what percentage would you say that you're diagramming? Oh, that's a good question. Um, I, whenever, I only diagram the ones that have like, uh, statements where there's some or all, uh, so for some teachers or no, all there was one on, I, on a recent practice I took where it said like some teachers cook, use a certain kitchen, food is made in that kitchen. Therefore we can conclude that the teachers are preparing the food, which answer choice would make that logically valid. And so that one, I would be tempted to diagram because, okay, I know that some teachers use it, not all teachers use it, but all food is cooked, you know, that, that whole thing. That's how I would diagram. But it sounds like you're saying that that might not be, uh, but, but uh, so you asked the percentage, so I'd say maybe a proportion of those kinds of questions, maybe 10%. Um, I'm definitely not doing it for the vast majority, but, uh, but for those, I, that would be my default. And then also parallel reasoning, uh, where I, I mentioned this yesterday on the call, but I, I feel just, I have a crutch uh, on uh, uh, parallel reasoning because once I see those big paragraphs, I just get really intimidated because each answer choice, you know, and I'm nervous about wasting time and I get in my own head. So, yeah. I hear you. Well, 10% is not bad. That's, we're talking two, three questions a section that you're diagramming. I'd say four to five. But okay, more. four to five. Okay. Yeah, be more. That could still be okay, depending on exactly which question types they were. I mean, parallels are one of the types that I might sometimes diagram. A lot of folks do like to diagram the sum, most, all kinds of questions, which I wouldn't always do. I like to diagram only all statements because some and most are not true conditionals. And so they require a little bit of recognition that it's a, a soft conditional or not a true conditional. But that's beside the point here. I think overall the idea is that you're not diagramming most of them, which is really good to hear. No, no, definitely not most. I would even argue that I've gotten to the point where I'm not relying on intuition. Like I've, I've practiced the basics, but I'm good enough at spotting what wrong answers look like that I can kind of answer fairly quickly. Um, it's just when I start to get to like those later tougher questions, I slow down a bit. Also on that, uh, would you, would you recommend uh, and uh, do, would you always recommend going with the easier questions first, like the, in, for logical reasoning, the, the, the earlier questions, um, but would it not make sense to do the harder ones first? I would do the easier ones first. Okay. I was just Everything, everything's worth the same. There's no benefit right. to 
spending more time on tougher questions if you haven't already gotten the easy ones done and secured in the bag. I was just wondering. Um, cool, cool. And then for, uh, for reading comp, what separates the 160 score from the 170s? Structure over details. Okay, structure over detail. So that would be uh, main point, uh, the tone, uh, like premises and evidence, uh, conclusion, uh, um, what, what would you say is the most efficient way to read the passage to get a sense of the structure? Looking for the author's opinion and focusing on that. Okay. You're not really reading for the information. You're not really reading for the content. Of course, it's important to know where the details are so you can go back and find them when you need to. But as you said, there is a certain category of questions where you can knock those out just having a good sense of the main idea and why the author wrote this. And so as the global ones, main idea, primary purpose, passage organization, tone, and title. I would knock out those questions first because those are the easiest ones and because you can knock them out simply knowing the author's opinion. Okay. Okay. Yeah. I, I've, I've tried to practice that a bit where um, I give myself like limited time to, to, to read the passage, but then I'll, I'll, I'll try to attack questions in the most efficient order. So I'll go after like the specific word questions, uh, tone, usually anything that isn't about the, the big picture. Um, but that, that's more in terms of speed. Um, but, but no, that, 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 that makes sense. Um, I actually have another question that's more so based on the digital platform. Obviously, when we're taking the exam on the, on the page, we can kind of scan the different questions versus on the digital, you'd have to click through, particularly for reading comp where, at least for me, the questions are all separate. Um, does that, would you still recommend it, even though you have to click through different questions uh, to try and find which ones might be easier to answer first? Yeah, it's definitely a bit more annoying. So I would just say, try it and see if it works for you. Okay. It's, you know, clicking left and right takes another second or so, but I can understand that you're lacking that bird's eye view could be frustrating. Okay, cool. But um, play with it. And you're right that you can only see one question at a time, both on the digital and on the flex. Right, right. Um, I think that other than that, uh, yesterday I asked about study plans. Um, you know, I, I got some good advice there, but... I know you said uh, be deliberate about what I choose to review, and I got advised to review quickly after taking exams, like not waiting too long, so I still remember my thought process. Um, I guess if, uh, if there's anything besides that, what I just mentioned, that you would advise someone who's trying to get to the 170s by October, anything else you would recommend? I think between today and yesterday, you've got a lot to think about, a lot of food for thought, a lot to work on. And I would encourage you again, regarding reading comp, that last piece we were talking about is to keep in mind what we discussed yesterday in the group coaching call around trying out different approaches and experimenting. You have two months, so you have plenty of time to play and see what you like and what you don't like. Okay. Cool, cool, cool. That, this is very helpful. Um, okay, yeah, this is very helpful. Um, could I ask about rec letters really quick? Yeah, sure. Okay, so I, I have a, a recommendation letter of, that my recommender asked that I draft. Uh, she is a non-academic recommender, but I, I really value her perspective. And I was wondering, uh, what are some really quick things to make sure that you are mentioning in a, especially since I have to draft it, I'm not an expert on this stuff, but what are things I should mention and what should I avoid? Um, or what, what, what for, for a draft, like what, what, what should be, um, what's appropriate and what, what should I stay away from? Yeah, well, I think the red flag is damning with faint praise. So be specific and make relative comparisons. So specifics would be details about, your know, details or anecdotes about their time with you and what they've observed, what you've done. And then relative comparisons. So if you, if you stood out in some way, 
in the work environment or in the classroom environment, whatever it was. In this case, obviously work environment or extracurricular, I would imagine in some way. Okay, cool, cool, cool. So if, uh, you, if you took initiative in a certain area, okay, that helps you stand apart. Do, you, do they care more about if you would be a good student or if you would be a good lawyer? That's a good question. Wow. I, I would think about showing that you have what it takes to succeed in law school. And that also relates to what, how, what shows how you would succeed in professional environments. So it's about, I think, persistence is a big thing. Okay. Ability to overcome obstacles. Okay. A lot of this carries across both. Okay. Uh, perfect, perfect. All right. Um, I know we've got our, our 15 minute uh, uh, time, uh, but uh, this has been very helpful, Steve. Um, I'm really grateful and I'll be, I'll be sure to uh, peruse through your, uh, your channel and uh, the Facebook group to, to see if there's anything else, but, but this, is, um, this is really useful. So thank you so much. Fantastic, no, I'm glad to help. But before we sign off, what would you say is the biggest insight you got from our call, either today or yesterday or both? Sure, sure. I think that I need to be more intentional about uh, trying out different strategies. I think that uh, if I want to progress, I have to be, I, I, I can't just re rely on rote, uh, you know, like, okay, this is what I'm supposed to do for these. Like I have to be able to uh, think flexibly. I think that that's something that, uh, that really stood out to me, uh, particularly for uh, um, the method of reasoning, uh, both for logical reasoning and for reading comprehension. I think if I can figure out how to identify the method of reasoning without relying on a diagram. Uh, I think that that's, uh, that'll help me uh, get over the edge for, uh, for my intended score. So I, that's, that's something that I'll carry with me. Fantastic. Well, keep at it and let me know if you need anything moving forward. Yeah. Thank you, Steve. I appreciate it, man. You're the man. <laughs> <laughs> Subscribe right. to his YouTube channel, please. <laughs> if, you're, if you're looking to go to law school, this guy, this guy knows what he's doing. Thanks, Richard. I appreciate it. Well, all the best and keep in touch. Thanks for tuning into the show. Please subscribe if you haven't done so already to be notified of new episodes as I release them. And feel free to reach out if you need anything at all as you move forward with your prep. I'm happy to help however I can. In the meantime, I wish you all the best and take care.